In our opinion, it should be gone. Okay, I think payment for order flow distorts order routing and it distorts the price of something because of the way they're separating it like that. I don't think they're going to get rid of it because the, the, the people in Washington and the lobbyists are very, very strong. And the folks like, you know, who are smart are paying these lobbyists to make sure that those rules don't change. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. In the past, I've had market expert Joe Saluzzi on this program to explain the huge but hidden world of high frequency trading algorithms, payment for order flow, and dark exchanges. In general, they confer an unfair advantage to the institutions that wield them and oftentimes result in outcomes that impair the prospects of regular retail investors like you and me. Well, after years of seemingly turning a blind eye to their exploitation of our financial system, the SEC has just proposed a sweeping set of rule changes designed to better level the playing field. I've already lined up Joe to come back on Wealthion in early January to make sense of these proposed changes for us. Up until that time, I thought it would be useful for us all to watch this replay of Joe's previous appearance on this channel explaining how the current exploitative technologies and practices work. He does a wonderful job of making a complex subject easy for the regular investor to understand. But be warned, his description of many of the current practices powerful Wall Street players use against the little guys like us may make your blood boil. Enjoy. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Adam Taggart, founder of Wealthion, welcoming you back for another week of making sense of money and the markets. We talk a lot about the markets and the price of financial assets on this program every week. But today, we're going to talk about the plumbing of that system, how it runs and how in many ways it operates in ways that most of us don't see or understand. And how in many cases, this obscurity and what goes on within it further slants the odds against regular investors like you and me. We're fortunate to be joined today by Joe Saluzzi, partner, co-founder, and co-head of equity trading of Themis Trading LLC, a leading independent agency brokerage firm that trades equities for institutional money managers and hedge funds. He's also the co-author of the book, Broken Markets, How High Frequency Trading and Predatory Practices on Wall Street Are Destroying Investor Confidence. Joe, it's so good to see you again, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on the program today. My pleasure. Always love talking to you. Thanks, Joe. Well, look, um, I'm going to dive into all of those questions about the, the plumbing and how markets work and how they may or may not remain broken here. But before we do, I'd just like to start with a question I ask every one of our uh, guest experts before I introduce any potential biases of my own. What is your current assessment of today's global economy and financial markets? Well, I think everything is based on the Fed. How about that? I, I think, you know, markets are, sometimes you look at them and you say these prices are ridiculous. You know, it's inflated. We've had a bull market. We're running off the lows so much, you know, 50, you know, the lows of the post, you know, pre-pandemic, right when the pandemic hit. But you, you got to think about, you know, what's driving the market. And the, and the market is being driven by the Fed. It's been, been driven by the Fed for the last 13 years, in my opinion. So you can fight it and say, hey, this is ridiculous. This is stupid. I'm going to short this thing. Or you kind of hold your nose a little bit. So I'm kind of in the camp where I say, you know, I'll hold my nose as long as they're in there because the market loves the Fed being in. The, it, it's just, it is what it is. Look at every headline when it comes out. So, you know, are we overvalued? Yeah, we're probably getting towards the upper end. And when you look at traditional P.E. ratios and things like that. But am I going to say short the market or sell the market? No, because I'm not getting way of that big freight train called the Federal Reserve. So as long as they are there. I'd say that the, the market is going to continue on, even in light of a pandemic and growth rates that are going backwards, right? And as long as the second barrel of the shotgun being the federal, the, the fiscal side of it and, and the federal government continuing to pump in money, another you know, half 550 billion yesterday, they were talking about a new money infrastructure projects. You, you, you can't get in front of that. You can't say, hey, we're this is bad on valuation. So my I, my part is I go along with it. Um, I would guess I would be bull. I'd be bullish in that sense. But, you know, I, I just think the money is coming in and you don't fight it. OK, great. So uh, it's dictated by money flows right now. We've got uh, both the monetary and the fiscal uh, spigots turned on high. And until you see that change, you're going to have a, a, an optimistic slant. Um, great. OK, so now that's uh, 
that, that's prices. Um, and maybe we'll talk more about prices as we get into the end of this discussion. But I want to go deeper. And by deeper, I mean literally down into the networks of plumbing oh, yeah. that all this runs on. So can you uh, do us a favor and just, just start by giving us an overview of how the U.S. equity markets operate? And, and specifically, I'm talking about the exchanges. Can you just can you sort of just you know deconstruct for us exactly how it all works? Sure, sure. And it all changed. So, you know, and in 2007, 2000, that was like the big year when everything changed in the stock market. There was a rule called Reg NMS, and it, it really changed the old specialist, quote unquote, system, which used to be the New York Stock Exchange, right? We I say used to be. There would be 80% of the stock trading on the stock exchange. Now it's about you know 15% on the floor of the exchange. So what happened was in 2007, they 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 basically said, okay, you can have all these different exchanges. Regan Musk came out and said, if you, Adam, can start your own exchange, and if you do, you'll be part of the quote. So today we have 16 stock exchanges. Okay. Most of those are under the three families, which we call the families, which is the New York Stock Exchange. They own uh, the New York, they own five. NASDAQ owns three, and the SIBO owns four stock exchanges. So there's, there's a good chunk. There's a few smaller ones. There's IEX, which we're a big fan of, by the way, to all, full disclosure. We don't have any investment in them, but we're, we're big users of IEX. We think they're doing some great things there, and we get some great fills there. Then there's Memex, which is a new one, and a few others, the Miami Stock Exchange, the, the long-term stock exchange. So all of these stock exchanges, and then take on top of that at least two dozen ATSs or alternative trading systems. Some people refer to them as dark pools. These are the hidden liquidity centers. So those are usually broker operated and they're, you know, they are regulated by the exchange, uh, by the SEC. They do have to file uh, certain forms and so on, but those are dark pools. Those are non-lit venues. So you take all of this stuff and you put it together, right? And this is now, when you look at your quote, if you pull up your Ameritrade or Schwab or wherever you trade Robinhood or whatever, and you look at a quote and it says $10 bid offered at $10.05. Well, that's a consolidation of all of those 16 stock exchanges, and it's giving you the best bid or best offer. And then within that best bid and offer, likely a lot of times you'll have a lot of those dark pool, you know, midpoint peg orders, or some people will just put in the limit orders or whatnot. And those are the hidden venues. So they'll all interact. Now, anything, anytime it trades on a dark pool, you'll see it on the tape, but you won't see it prior to. This goes on all day long. And what happened was it shattered the liquidity. OK, so we used to have these deep pools of buckets of liquidity at the exchange. The specialists had a book. Now, there was issues there as well. People complained about that and they were valid concerns and specialists got fined and some of them got arrested for what they were doing down there. But that book of deep liquidity was there and institutions felt comfortable with it. So like my job is to trade for institutions. What we do during the day when we're not writing notes or books or things like that, we trade for institutional clients. So, you know, my, I have mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds. They all come to us and they say, hey, execute this for me. I need you to do a good job. So I've got to navigate that maze that I just explained to you and try to maximize the liquidity while minimizing their cost and make sure that no one spots me. And it's, it's, it sounds... You know, it's it's a lot harder than it sounds. So, we, you know, we've been doing this for almost 20 years now as an independent small brokerage firm, which I think proves that you know what we're doing is some good work in, in you know, basically fighting HFTs, algorithms, and everything else. So it's a complicated process. What looks simple when you look at that quote on Robinhood or Meritrade is a lot going on beneath the scenes. All right. So help me and our viewers understand, Joe, then you said sort of the game kind of changed in 2007, 2008. Um what was the rationale for changing it this way? It sounds like you're saying um, it has made the liquidity more shallow on, on any one given individual exchange. That doesn't sound like a plus to me. So what, what was sort of the consumer benefit rationale to let this happen? Or, or was there none? Was this just letting people who wanted to uh, develop their own advantages, uh, giving, giving them free reign to do so? Yeah, you'll, you'll hear the word competition a lot. And, and the, the regulators and the folks who help the regulators craft that new that rule called Reg NMS will say that, hey, we need competition to the duopoly of the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, which essentially there was only two stock exchanges. And then there were a few ATSs. There was a, a firm called Instanet, which I actually worked at before we went here, which we were trading off exchange. And they wanted to say, let's create this new venues where everyone gets to compete and we get to go part of that NBBO or the National Best Bidder Offer. And there'll be a trade through rule as well, and which is a big part of NMS, which means that if there's an offer at five cents and I'm trading offering at six cents on another exchange, you can't trade with me until you trade with the five cent guy, which is a fair thing. And it is fair. 
but it does, there's a lot of things like I was saying before that go on beneath that quote. So that that quote may only be good for a hundred shares. The guy behind him may be good for 10,000 shares, but you can't get to him until you get to him. And then you start these races, which we'll maybe get into later with the high frequency trading guys, what they did all over those years. And they figured out something called latency arbitrage, where they were basically, to, they were able to ping exchanges off of each other and race to go to one, to go to another. And it created, in our opinion, excessive noise, excessive cost. And, you know, somewhere along the way, we, we, we lost track of what are we trying to do here? We're trying to maximize liquidity and minimize costs, right? And it became a different game. Okay. So, yeah. So, all right. So when, when there's less liquidity, we get the risk of things like uh, flash crashes, which I want to talk to you about in a bit here. Um, and you said the theory here was more competition um, was going to lead to better pricing, right? For the, for the customer, or better execution. Um, it sounds like from a lot of the things you listed, maybe that that didn't happen. And and you mentioned HFTs. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that too. Um, but I, I you know it's been what 13 years or so since uh, Reg NMS got got uh, enacted. Um, are are we net better off now or not? I mean, it sounds like a guy like you is spending a lot of your day, like you said, having to navigate and fight. You know hack through mm -hmm. the system and, and, and try to defend yourself from all the you know parties that are sort of trying to take advantage yeah. of you. And you're a professional uh, who does this for institutions. You know, the, the rest of us are just people who, you know, go to Fidelity and click the buy button. And we don't we don't see what we don't have any visibility to what's going on in the background. Uh, are, are we in a better place now than we were before Reg NMS or a worse place? I, I think there's two ways of looking at it. Like when you say retail, a lot of people say, OK, I'm a retail client and they say, OK, I'm going to trade. AT&T or IBM. And if you're only trading, say, once or twice a year or a few times a month for that matter, and it's small, let's just say in relatively small size, you're probably not getting hurt. You're probably saying, okay, I'm just going to, you know, so I pay up a penny for it or, or whatever. You just want that trade done. And you're thinking about a long-term view of it, maybe six months, a year, two years, five years, whatever. You'll be okay today. You're fine. Now, but let's look at it a different way. Suppose you're also a retail investor, but you have a 401k. You work at a company where you're, you have a pension, maybe you're a state employee. Well, that pension or that 401k is invested in bigger funds, whether they be mutual funds or they're trading it themselves, and they've got to move serious size. Pension funds are multi-billion dollar organizations. When they're coming in and out, those are the bulls coming through the market. So if that bull is being, you know, bulls, I shouldn't call them bulls because they could be bears, whatever, right? but they're coming through and they're the elephants, let's call them that. And they're easily spotted unless they're being careful on what they do. And that's where the transaction costs may be leaking. So your 401k or your pension fund is maybe losing some percentage points because of the execution quality of the traders there. And I'm not saying that it's good. There's a lot of sophisticated traders. A lot of people know the game now. We know how to kind of navigate this, but it still takes a like excessive amount of work and they're not getting those deep pools of liquidity. They're not matching up with the other side that they're trying to do. What they do most of the time is they chop it up at algorithms throughout the day. So for instance, say a large pension fund has to sell 100,000 shares of XYZ stock or whatever. They don't just put it out there in one chunk. They say, put it into a VWAP algo, which is a volume weighted average price or some sort of algorithm, which will slice and dice throughout the day. And guess what? The sophisticated computers can spot that as well. And they can trade ahead of, and I'm not going to say front run because it's not their client, but they can trade ahead of and basically take advantage of that flow. So my point is you as a retail, you have to look at it in two ways. Yes, you are trading Robinhood or, or TD Ameritrade, but more importantly, you do have those bigger funds, mutual funds, hedge funds, and so on that you might be invested in. And that's where you have to be careful. All right, so let, let me ask you this. Um, I think a lot of people watching this video probably maybe saw the, read the book Flash Boys by Michael Lewis, or maybe saw the 60 Minutes interview with him or some of the other interviews he did. So they probably have a general sense that at least as of you know five plus years ago, that there was this massive arms race where companies were investing in all sorts of technologies, uh, high frequency trading algorithms, uh, they were, you know, in, in investing in digging fiber optic cables uh, to have a shorter uh, distance to get to the exchange so that th their orders could get there before anybody else's. You're having this massive uh, arms race and battle that's happening in microseconds. Um, but the, the people who have the advantage, they can front run orders or they can, um, you know, see what somebody else is doing and trade in advance. Um, and uh, to your earlier comment, you know, that, that sort of adds friction to the system in a way that that you know we might be talking fractions of pennies, but over huge, tremendous volume, 
that can be millions, you know, if not more, uh, that these guys are siphoning off of the system. I see you nodding here, but my, my, my general question for you is, has that been more or less cleaned up by this point in time? Are we still living in a world where there are these um, highly sophisticated, highly resourced um, players that are basically operating as, as market parasites here, where they are looking at the data and you know jumping in front of those elephants you mentioned, and you know adding friction and cost on there that that really shouldn't be there in a perfect world. Um, that over the, the the big picture, you know, hurts the system, but it enriches them in the process. Yeah, and and they're still there. They they haven't gone away. And what's interesting is that they've kind of fought themselves. They they beat each other up over the years so much that these smaller ones got pushed out because the cost got too high. And the cost, the cost for, you know, one, I don't know what it exactly is, but somebody will come up and to, you know, to shave one microsecond off of trading is extremely high. A microsecond, you know, we're talking about slivers of say, a billionth of a second, you know, ridiculous amount of time frame. So like you, what you referred to earlier with the Michael Lewis book, where they, they drilled a hole through the Pennsylvania mountains to go from Chicago to New York because they wanted to know what the futures prices were in Chicago so they can trade against the cash in New York just before everybody else. And the company that drilled that line charged a huge amount of you know, freight, or whatever you want to call it, to get access to the line. Well, that didn't last very long because the new technologies came out, microwaves, lasers. This is what they're doing now. They can continue to shave off latency, as they call it, because they need to trade ahead. And get, it becomes a game of not who's going who's gonna to lose, it's who's going to win. So the HFT world will always beat the institutional slower traders, the retail, it's a question of who, which one of them is going to win the race. So to win the race, you have to invest constantly in these, whether it's your programming knowledge, your, 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 the, your people that you're hiring or the hardware that you're using. And, and here's the rub, I think. They're just taking advantage of a system that's been built. I don't really necessarily have a problem if there's nothing illegal. Now, there has been some cases the SEC has found which were illegal and they, found, and they find them. However, they're taking advantage of a system which was built, let's say, starting in Reg NMS, and which is supplied. I, I consider that they use these arms. I, I, I look at it in a war term. They're using the arms that are supplied by the stock exchanges. The stock exchanges are the arms merchants, except for a few. For instance, our friends at IEX don't do what I'm about to explain that the other ones do. The New York Stock Exchange, the Stebo, the NASDAQ, they all have co-location centers where they allow you to take your computer and put it right next to their main matching engine so you can reduce the latency. Their algorithms are right in their computer sitting there. And as soon as a market moves, whether it's the futures market or some other pair that they're looking at, they will send in an order immediately. In addition to the co-location, they will buy direct data feeds from the stock exchanges who are more than happy to supply this at a high cost, extremely high cost. So, and they'll take that information and they'll, they'll rapidly fix, figure out what's going on. And then they'll try to win the race. It's always about winning the race. Can I win the race? Can I beat the, and the bigger ones won and they knocked out the smaller ones. So you'll see it over the years, the past few years, smaller HFTs either got merged into bigger ones or they went out of business because they couldn't compete. The bigger ones just kept getting bigger and bigger and fatter and fatter and more dominant in there. And they're out there now extremely dominant, but they're being supplied by the stock exchanges to do what they do. So if you ask me who's really at fault here, I would say the stock exchanges. They shouldn't be giving out this information. They shouldn't be doing certain certain things, but they do. And it's all legal. It's crazy. It sort of sounds like a, a bank uh, selling uh, safe cracking tools to safe crackers. <laughs> Even though <laughs> yes, safe cracking is exactly. illegal, they're still making a lot of money selling those, those tools. They're going to do it. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, so you, you mentioned that um, the, the industry has evolved so that the smaller players got out competed and we now have, have the, the bigger, most dominant players. Um, are we worse off now than we were? Or, or you know, I, I, I'm curious, when we look at it in terms of the impact on society and the impact on, you know, regular people, um, is it better to have a few big offenders in this case or to have many small ones duking it up? That's a good question because, you know, are they competing with each other and that would that help if there were smaller ones and fighting each other? You know, I don't know. It's like you put 12, put 20 crooks in the room. Is that better? I, I don't necessarily know there. I think that the SEC did find, you know, and I think they're outgunned, by the way, the SEC, they don't have the, 
the budget to really keep up with this. They don't even have the knowledge up until now. They finally, built, by the way, they finally built something called the Consolidated Audit Trail, which took since the flash crash of 2010, when, when it was first invented or thought about. So here we are in 2021, 11 years later, and they're just finalizing something called the Consolidated Audit Trail, which will take all of these exchanges and, and options exchanges and stock exchanges and kind of consolidate that data so that the SEC can get this better eye in the sky to figure out, are these guys really doing something bad? Are they spoofing one market so they can lay it off in another? Are they bidding on an exchange here so they can sell it in a dark pool here? They can't tell right now. It's very difficult to find out who's doing what. So I think the Consolidated Audit Trail will help them. I hope to see that. I hope to see if they bring a number of cases against these guys who have been doing some of these bad things. But one of the problems, with the, even with the cat, they call it the cat, they don't have futures data. So what we were talking about before, whether you need to know what's going on in Chicago and the futures market to, to and, and the New York cash market, well, the SEC is only going to have the cash market. So even though it's a much better system, it's still only a, a, you know, a piece of the pie. They really need to get the two together. But the CFTC controls the futures market. The SEC regulates the cash and the options in the exchange and the stock market. They don't talk to each other. You know, they're, they're, it's two competing regulators. So you got a problem there. And guess what? The, the bad guys know that. <laughs> and they're, they're more yeah. than happy to take advantage of it. So, so to kind of continue your analogy of the arms race, I mean, it's sort of like the the, the bad actors here are using howitzers and uh, the law enforcement teams are using pea shooters, right? Um, you, you talked about the cat. The cat, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's sort of like a master tape, right? So you mentioned we have all these different exchanges now uh, that, that uh, things run on and uh, really nobody, uh, at least nobody on the, the regulatory side, had a master view as to what was happening across them. So they could be watching maybe one exchange and some player's behavior on that exchange, but totally ignorant on what that player was doing over on you know, a, a different exchange. Uh, and now that they've got the cat running, that helps, but you're saying it's still not complete, right? So, um, okay. in, in, in like anything, usually, uh, you know, if there's money to be made, if there's big money to be made, um, you know, the players that operate in that space will probably always be able to out innovate and outspend uh, the inf you know, law enforcement agencies. That's just sort of the way it's always sort of been from time immemorial. I see a nodding here. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'll tell you a quick side story on the cat. Before yeah. you go on. The cat, the predis, right now, FINRA is building the cat. They're finalizing FINRA, the self-regulatory agency that we all are members of, which is great. But the predecessor to FINRA was a firm called Thesis, and they were originally designed to build this cat. Thesis was an offshoot of an HFT firm called Tradeworks. They came out and they bid for the project, essentially. And who was in charge of selecting the winning bidder? The SROs, the stock exchanges. So you talk about the, the fox in the hen house. They select the firm, which, which botched it up. You can't intentionally or not, I don't know, but they botched this thing up. So it took years of, of delays and, and problems. And finally, they, they said, you, you're done. You, you're done. You get rid of you, FINRA, come in and fix this thing. But it was a wrench in the engine. And was it there put, was it put there intentionally? Right, was it intentional? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I'm not on the inside of that, but it's certainly suspicious to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, at the end, it certainly served their interests, right? So um, let, let's move now to what I understand and not ent entirely well, I'm looking for you to clarify things here, um, is kind of sort of one of the next generations in which, uh, you know, average investors are being predated in ways that they don't understand. And, and this is this um, payment for order flow model that's been created. Um, so Robinhood, that's a name that a lot of people recognize because it's in its in the, uh, the media a lot. You know, th that's a new uh, trading platform and it's zero commission trades. So if you open an account with Robinhood, you can make as many trades as you want and Robinhood's not gonna charge you anything for that. Well, why are they, how do they make money if they're not gonna charge you, right? In the old, old days, you, they'd charge you a commission. Well, what they do is they sell their trading data to companies that wanna buy that data and then use that data to basically as an advantage in their own trading. And I think Citadel is a huge purchaser of Robinhood's data flow, uh, order flow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so can you comment on this? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ink being spilled right now about how this is great because it, it opened up the era, uh, it, it, it opens up trading and investing to uh, many more people that couldn't quote afford to do it beforehand. Um, and of course, there's a lot of people on the other side of this saying, hey, look, if, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. Yeah. And, uh, and that a lot of stuff's being done with this, this data that actually is making 
the price you pay more expensive down the road or putting you at some sort of disadvantage. So can you, do you have a strong opinion one way yeah. or the other here? Yeah. And, and, and just as a, as, an, as a little history on payment for order flow, it goes back decades. And one of the original brokers who, who brought payment for order flow to the market was Bernie Madoff and Madoff Securities. And what they did was they tried to trade New York Stock Exchange stocks off of, like we were talking about before, 80% was traded on exchange. Well, a sliver of it was traded off exchange. And it was a firm like Madoff that came in and said, I'll pay you for your order flow if you send it to me and I'll execute it for you, Mr. Retail Broker. And then he figured out a way to make money off of it. Well, you know, go fast forward 20, 30 years, that model has now been embedded deep, deep into the stock market. Everything revolves around payments and rebates. This is the way it works. So Robinhood is more than happy to say, hey, zero commission. And we'll pick on Robinhood because, like you said, they're the ones in the news. They're going to route that order not to a stock exchange, not to a dark pool, and which are, by the way, all dark pools are not bad. They're getting they, there's their they're ATSs, but we'll get to that later if you want. But they will route it to a market maker. And Citadel happens to be the, big, big, be the biggest one out there. There's a few others. And the market maker will say, okay, I'll pay you 10 mils, a tenth of a penny, 15 mils. Robinhood happened to figure out a better way of doing it. They get a percentage of the spread. So the wider spread names, they actually make more money. So there's a conflict of interest right there, but they will get a payment for every order that they send over to the market maker who will pretty much guarantee a fill. Okay, now the market maker is going to commit their capital and say, I will sell, you know, okay, you're looking to buy hundred shares. I'll sell it to you. I'll even give you price improvement. I'll even say, okay, if the stock is offered, say the stock is $15 bid offered at $15.05, I'll give it to you at 15 spot 049, slight price improvement. So the client says, oh, wonderful. I beat the offer and it cost me zero. What, what's the problem here? Well, the problem is the market maker doesn't do this. Why would somebody pay to execute and take risk? Okay, essentially the market maker is taking risk at that point because he sold you stock and now he's got to go out there and buy it and flatten his position out. Well, it becomes not necessarily about that one order. It becomes a question of all the orders. Can, can, you know, if they can see them all together, well, then they get much more intel on it. And it's just that it's their business model. Okay, I, I get it. I understand what the market makers are doing. The funny thing is the market makers, you know, if you said to them, if payment for order flow ended tomorrow, they would still make money. They would still figure this out. The problem is going to be the retail brokers. So everyone got used to zero commission. The retail brokers couldn't do it anymore. They would have to go back to seven, ten dollars a trade, and then of course the retail community would be up in arms. How could you charge me ten dollars? I was just paying zero. Well, you were paying more than zero, and we would argue that all of this flow that gets done off exchange is actually hurting the spread. Okay, where in, in, instead, if your order was going in and it was helping the limit order book build a book, tightening the spread. That fifteen dollar bid offered at fifteen oh five may actually be fifteen oh three offered at fifteen oh four. So it's a penny wide spread of real deep liquidity with really retail interacting, institutions interacting, everybody getting together. That's how you get price discovery. But when you separate flow and you start to pull it in all different directions and essentially segment it. And Chairman Gensler, the SEC's new chair, he had two problems when he was talking about market makers. And one of them was segmentation and the other was concentration. So segmentation, he said that you're segmenting this flow. It should be interacting, like I just said, and also concentration in that it's going to, going to a few big market makers. It's making them really strong. So I believe that the SEC is going to be coming out shortly, because they said they were, that they were doing a study of the GameStop uh, scenario earlier in the year, and they may make, start to make some, some proposals to change some of this payment for order flow. In our opinion, it should be gone. OK, I think payment for order flow distorts order routing and it distorts the price of something because of the way they're separating it like that. I don't think they're going to get rid of it because the, the, the people in Washington and the lobbyists are very, very strong. And the folks like, you know, who are smart are paying these lobbyists to make sure that those rules don't change. So we'll see. But we think it's just a bad thing that shouldn't even be in the market. All right. That's a great explanation of a complicated topic, Joe. And for you folks that are watching, um, if you are enjoying this video and having great experts like Joe in the program, please take just a quick second and hit that like button below. All right, Joe. So let's say that uh, you get your wish. Um, the uh, Gensler rules that, uh, you know what, we're, we're getting ready to pay for order flow. Um, wh what do you think would happen? What would the repercussions be? Uh, retail commissions are going to go up. Okay. Commission, they all of a sudden, because uh, Robinhood makes 80% of their money from paying for order flow. So you can't be in business 
right. if you're so a retail Robinhood goes out of business, but everybody else, Fidelity, whatever, they're going to start well, charging a couple well, bucks a trade again. It, it used to be five bucks a trade, eight bucks a trade. But I would argue that may not be the worst thing because I, I think that zero commissions actually is hurting things. I think it's causing too much trading. I think it's causing, it's becoming the gamification is the word that a lot of people have used where people feel like I can get in and out of things. It's not costing me anything. It's causing over trading, which is the worst thing, by the way, a retail investor can do is over trade because you're going to end up, I compare it to the casinos in Las Vegas. Why do they build billion dollar hotels and casinos in Las Vegas? It's not because of the room rates. It's because of the folks at the table who just continue to spend money. And the longer they can keep those folks at the table, we'll give them some free drinks if they need to keep them there, the odds are they're going to lose money. If you come in only one and you bet one hand and you walk away, well, you're a winner. They don't want you. They want the losers. And the losers stay there longer and they over trade. And that's what happens in the stock market. You end up doing things you shouldn't do. Maybe you got an idea and you, you and somebody told you something and you made some money and then you go back in and you do it again. And next thing you know, you're losing money. It becomes a, a bad, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an investor. I don't like to trade. I like to invest in stocks that I think are good in my, own, in my own personal portfolio. I don't like to trade them in and out. I think that in the end, you'll lose. So the market loves that volume. Stock exchanges love that. The more volume you do, the more money they make because they can sell the data feeds and the co-location for, for more money. But when the volumes contract, and I, to go back to your question, what I think would happen is volumes would lower. So, you know, we're averaging maybe about 10 billion shares a day in the U.S. now. I think you'd probably shave 20 percent of that off overnight because that's excessive noise. It doesn't need to be there. But I don't think it's a bad thing. And I also think that you'll start to get deeper pools of liquidity and tighter spreads. Yeah. Can, can, can I restate what you said just to make sure that I'm, I'm understanding correctly? So if you estimate that about 20 percent of the trade volume really is sort of unnecessary or over trading, as you're saying, the net result of that then to what you're saying is, is um, the, the, the more you trade, the more you over trade, the more the odds are going against you. Right. So basically that that's that that 20 percent that's excessive is basically only hurting people and enriching the few money makers that are participating in the pay for uh, order flow. Is that is that true? Like we basically say 20 percent of current right. trading that is really nothing but just sort of a, a money transfer from the poor over traders to the, the filthy rich uh, few right. market makers. And I'm guessing on 20, of course, I don't know the number. Wh whatever. There's, yeah. a, there's a percentage. But as a whole. Right. Uh, again, there may be a few traders out there who are excellent traders who know exactly what they're doing, who pick their spots, who use great technicals, have great fundamental analysis, and they trade a lot. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also a lot of other traders who are coming in based on something that they saw on a message board and somebody else told them to do something and they really don't know. And they're just kind of guessing. The guessing will go away. OK, that's really what shouldn't be in the market, because guess when you guess you will lose. Eventually, you're going to lose. Yeah, I, I just just as a, a fun anecdote, I had a I had a uh, a really nice guy, early twenties, hadn't gone to college. He was here doing some side jobs at the house. In the three hours that he was here, uh, he must have placed eight trades on his Robinhood app on his phone. Um, and you know, best of luck to him. You know, <laughs> I hope I hope they prove to be winners. But you know, we chatted for a little bit, and that that wasn't a unique thing. He says he trades. I can't remember how many trades he says he does a week. But you know, if that's indicative of the type of person that you're referring to, which I think you you are, you know, the average Joe, um, particularly one that doesn't have a ton of money, uh, that can afford to lose a ton of their yeah. money uh, to be trading like that, is to me just sort of feels like playing with fire. I see you nodding here. Yeah, and I think that's the problem. And I think you know, apps like Robinhood encourage that style of trading. You know, some people again, we, they call it gamification. They made it really easy. And there's you know, confetti. I heard they got rid of the confetti and you know, things like it's not a game, right? And and you know, it's not gambling. It's investing. And I think if you want to gamble, you know, you want to go to a, one of those gambling apps. That's fine. But this is investing. And I and I think the folks who are just hitting the button. You're going to lose. And there's an entire industry out there hoping that you keep hitting the button. Right. And they built it. For, you know, the market makers and HFT guys, the exchanges, this whole infrastructure that we're talking about. They stay in business, by the way. They're going to make money. They will always make money because they know what they're doing and they have their risk profiles. So I always you know, I always tell people that they ask me, well, what do you think of the market? What should I be doing? I'm like, don't over trade, you know, and stay invested in the market if you like it. And then you, you're an investor. It's different than a trader. Now, if you're a trader and you really are sophisticated and you've done your homework, I also encourage that. 
I think it's okay, trade. Let's go. But tell me, if I, my, I have two kids. I mean, if my kids ever ask me, you know, I want to buy a stock. I'm like, okay, first thing, tell me three good reasons. I want three good reasons why you're buying that stock. And then we'll talk from there. And if they go, oh, I read it, I saw it on a Reddit board. I'm like, nope, get rid of it. Yeah. And yeah, if one of them is, well, dad, it's going up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's not a reason. No. No. <laughs> Let's talk fundamentals. I say, Let's talk about where's the growth prospects of this company? Where are the earnings? You know, who's the management? Let's, let's talk real fundamentals. That's what matters. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, look, I want to move on because I, I, I do want to get pretty quickly to the uh, the flash crash that just happened in gold uh, over the past uh, weekend. Um, but real quick before we get there, um, you just said two things that I just want to make sure people take away. Uh, one is that um, it, in many ways, this whole pay for order flow is an idea that was largely pioneered by Bernie Madoff, right? So when you've got you know a, a, a major financial trend. Uh, that was instigated by one of the biggest swindlers, you know, in history. Probably not a great sign that it's uh, it's something we should be doing a lot of. Uh, and then, secondly, I know you were just taking a finger to the wind estimate, but but if there's a double digit percentage of existing trading that basically serves no real purpose except to take money from the inexperienced and stuff it into a po the pockets of a few big money makers, um, that's just a, a huge. Uh, you know, black mark against the current uh, system that we have in place. And those aren't the only problems, um, but but those are two pretty big damning ones. Um, okay, so moving on, you mentioned two things I just want to give a little bit of attention to um, before we move on to the flash crash. When you talked about dark pools, we've talked a little bit about HFTs. I just want to demystify that for viewers that don't aren't completely familiar with what those are. Um, why don't we start with dark pools? Um, let us know what they are. And you made a comment that was interesting. You said, hey, not, not all of them are bad. Um, right. When we hear them, we think, "Oh, this is activity that that's dark," and and you know, we hear like black ops in the military, like it <laughs> kind of has this sense of like, yeah. "Oh, whatever's happening there must not be good." Um, and I'm sure some bad stuff happens there. Uh, net net, are dark pools good for us? And and what can you do to demystify? Right, they're, they're, they're trading destinations. So let's, let's talk about that. By the way, the industry shot themselves in the foot when they when they referred to them as dark pools. This was years ago. And the theory was, okay, they're not in the lit, we call it the lit venue. So the, when you see a quote, we, we refer to that as lit. So if it's not lit, it's dark. So all of a sudden they started referring to them as dark pools. There's different types and the actual technical name from our alternative trading systems or ATSs. So every ATS out there has to file with the SEC. This is called a form ATS, which tells you more about what's going on, how they operate, you know, how they segment order flow, how they do things. Okay, so there is a bit of transparency as to the workings of a ATS. Okay, I'm going to continue to refer to it as an ATS. There's different types. Now, I, we trade, for, like I said before, we trade for institutional clients. I trade a lot on various exchanges. I'll trade on the New York. I'll trade on NASDAQ. I'll trade on IEX a lot. And I'll also trade on dark pools slash ATSs. Some of my favorite ones, there's one called Bids. There's another one called LiquidNet. Okay, um, these are... Let's just call them block trading venues where institutions, our job is to move institutional trades, to move blocks. I'm trying not to get chopped up all day because the more I get chopped up, the more I'm going to get spotted, which means my client's costs are going to go up. So if I can find a slug, as we call it, on the other side, a big trade, I'm going to do it. So if they say, hey, Joe, sell 50,000 shares of XYZ and I find 50 in a dark pool, we're going to put it up and we're going to put a trade to the tape. Now, that's like two ships crossing in the night, but it's, it's very difficult to get a trade of that kind of size nowadays, because there's so much noise in these venues. Then there are, okay, so those are the bigger ones, but then there are smaller venues. Um, the market makers operate their own venues, okay? The other brokers operate their venues. Some are good, some are noise in our opinion. So as, uh, again, we're, we're a little bit more sophisticated. What we can do is screen out the noise. So I will make sure that my, my order flow never touches what I'll consider a dirty dark pool. It's not going there. Okay, I can control that. I control my own flow. Others don't have that ability. Okay, other institutional traders don't have that ability, which basically means that they're going to get signaling. The more signaling you put, the higher trade cost you're going to be. But but here's an important point about a dark pool. Every time a trade goes up, whether it's 100 shares, 1,000 shares, or 50,000 shares, it hits the consolidated tape. In the United States, we have something called the consolidated tape. They don't have this in Europe, by the way, where every trade that happens instantaneously goes to the tape. And I can see which venue it went up on. 
So if it went up on the New York, I can see it. If it went up on NASDAQ, if it went up on the dark, well, it goes up in something called an ADF, an alternative display facility. I can kind of, I know it went off dark, but I don't know which dark pool it went off in. So, but I watch, I watch this like a hawk all day long. The traders over here, we got six traders. We sit there and we watch the consolidated tape to know where the trades are happening, to feel the tape. It's old fashioned what we do. It's really, it's not a scalable model, but it helps us trade. So I take advantage of the flow if I can in the dark pool. I'll try to find it there. The market makers will print every one of their pieces to a dark pool. They will print it to the, not to the, to the, you know, it'll go up on the tape and it'll show up as a non-exchange trade. It's not bad. You know, everyone's saying dark pools are bad, dark pools are bad. It's who's trading in the dark that may be bad. The dark pool didn't do anything. It's who's trading there. That's what you need to distinguish. All right. And, and you know, I think dark pools probably entered our consciousness probably about 10 years ago, uh, I'm guessing. Um, it, it, are, are the dark pools more cleaned up of bad actors these days than they may have been back then? Or is it, is it always been the same? Uh, the systems themselves, about a year or two ago, when the SEC had this call, it was an ATS, an amendment to rule ATS, where they required the dark pools to file these form ATSs, which are brutal to read, by the way. And I've read every single one of them. They're like 30 pages of pure, gory market structure mechanics inside baseball. If, I really, if you want to go to sleep one day, pull up the form ATS for one of these things. But it told <laughs> us a lot. It was really good. I learned a lot about the inner workings of some pools that I didn't really know about. Things called conditional orders, segmentation. They would segment certain flow over others. So did it clean up? Not necessarily. Did they shine a light on them? Yes. And when the light goes on, they turn your light on and the roaches are in the house. If, the, if it's dark, the roaches will be around. If you turn the light on, they scatter. Well, the, when, the, when the SEC turned the light on some of these dark pools, I believe some of the roaches scattered and they're not necessarily doing some of the things that they were doing in the past. But there's still behavior that goes on there. And the SEC is their job to police it. It's not easy. It's, it's not easy. But, you know, it's my job as a trader to make sure I don't get caught up in some of the traps that are being laid for them. Right, right. Um, all right. So dark pools are, um, you know, kind of like... Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good analogy here, but um, it, it, they can be used for good or evil. Um, hopefully, with more light that gets brought into there, they they do more good than evil over over time. The bad guys will have fewer shadows to hide in. Um, but uh, it's good that we've got professionals like you, you know, trying to figure out, how, wa watching closely, and, and and trying to you know find the right people to work with there. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, high frequency trading algorithms or HFTs, as we've been mentioning a lot here. Um, so this was a big problem. Um, I don't hear about it in the media as much as I used to. Um, part of that's because pay for performance has taken up so many of the headlines. Um, ha have they have they cleaned up a lot of the, the greatest successes of the HFTs or are we just hearing less about them because other new practices are stealing the, the headline ink? Yeah, I think you're just hearing less about them. I don't think they ever went anywhere. Uh, I do think they consolidated, like we were saying before, and they're bigger now. But, you know, payment for order flow is the headline. That's what everybody talks about. But the HFTs are, are still there and they're very dominant and because they, they trade so much. And high frequency trading means they trade a lot. Right. That's what HFT means. So think about this. Our arms merchants that we talked about before, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, the SIBO, they rely on their biggest customers to feed the money to pay that are paying for that co-location service, that are paying for those data feeds. They need to, when an HFT walks over to one of those exchanges and says, hey, you know what? I would like you to give a higher rebate if I were to give you more volume. Let's say I went up in a higher volume tier, which they call it. Can you increase my rebate? And sure enough, you'll see a filing coming through the, the, the rule changes that they want to change. Re and we can talk about rebates in a second. But the HFTs are dominant and they're still out there influencing behavior of these so-called arm merchants and still getting what they want. They're still making their money. They're still shaving a tenth of a penny here. They're still practicing what they call latency arbitrage, where they're able to ping one venue and go faster than another venue. It, it, it hasn't changed. They're underneath the surface. Some will say that they have liquidity. And without them, we would have a really poor market. I would say that they take liquidity as much as they add liquidity, and they're the cause of a lot of movements, a lot of you know mini flash crashes. They're out there, and they have no obligation, no obligation to supply liquidity. They're not market makers. They're proprietary traders who come and go whenever they please, yet they dominate so much. So 
you know, is it illegal? No. But is it a force in the market that you have to deal with? Absolutely. They're still there. Okay. So you, you mentioned IEX uh, Investors Exchange. This is run by Brad Katsuyama. He was featured in Michael Lewis's Flash Boys as an example of, of uh, you know, a new type of player who's trying to do things right for the investor. And, um, you know, basically they are uh, being much more transparent uh, and putting sort of some defensive measures in place to make it impossible on their exchange to do some of the things that HFTs do on a lot of the other exchanges. So um, two things. One, um, how are they doing? You know, are, 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 is business going their way? We'd obviously like to see more of the volume happen on, on exchanges that folks can feel better about. Um, and then secondly, uh, that, that, that's the, the industry sort of trying to clean itself up. What's happening on the regulatory side? Um, it, are there any movements underway to try to diminish the damage that the HFTs are doing to the system? Or are they so embedded and so politically and financially connected that they're just going to be here forever as far as we can tell? Yeah. Uh, for IEX wise, they're doing great. I think they're still doing well. Their market share doesn't really dictate and it'll tell you how well they're doing. So the market share of IEX is between two and 3% per day. Sounds like it's small, but you have to remember they don't list any stocks. So they're out. They don't get the opening and the closing prints, which is a significant amount of volume going on right now. The intraday volumes there are significant. And I can tell you as a small firm, we're, we're a relatively small institutional broker. Most days, we're trading north of 25% of our volume on IEX. How am I trading 25% yet their market share is two to 3%? Because I'm finding pieces of volume that I'm looking for and I'm not moving the market. And here's the problem. Here's the good thing about IEX. They don't offer co-location services. They don't supply individual proprietary data feeds order by order, which the other ones do. They do it on an aggregated basis, which feel, I feel much more comfortable that no one's going to see me there. And they have the speed bump, which is their classic you know, strategy with them they originally started. So when I trade on IEX, I don't see the movement and that noise, as we call it, as if I were to put an order on NASDAQ or Denizy or somewhere else. It's just a cleaner way of trading, and I feel much more secure trading my client's order flow there, and I'm getting the results, and we track all this with our trading cost analysis, and it's a, it's a solid venue that's still getting it done. Our institutional clients still love it, and that's where we're getting a significant amount of volume. I wish they were more. They're trying to get into the retail space more. They want that Robinhood order, that TD Ameritrade order to interface with them because a lot of most here, most IEX uh, orders, a lot of it is midpoint pegs. So there was orders are sitting in the middle of the spread. But we we're talking about before, if it's 15 bid offered at 1505, IEX a lot of times has an order in the middle of the spread at 15025, say. So if your broker says, okay, I'm going to sell my order flow to a market maker, he fills you at 15049. Well, he might have done a better job had he checked IEX first and got 15025. But if he did that, he's got to pay IEX a small transaction fee, which would kill his zero commission model. So brokers are incented not to get the best price. How crazy is that? They're incented uh. not to get best execution. They're incented to pad their own pockets first. And that's why payment for order flow is such a bad idea. So if they were to check the midpoints, and some of them are, if there's a commercial actually on interactive brokers during the day, and they say, we've got two models, zero commission, where we send it to market makers, and, or you can pay a small fee and direct your order yourself. Well, that to me is a better deal. I would rather direct my order and pay the fee because I think I can get a better job than because, but I'm a professional trader and this is what I do for a living. But a lot of times my point is, there's, there's stock in the midpoint. There might be better liquidity somewhere else, but by you sending it to the market maker, you, you don't know that. You don't know. So there have been studies both ways. They'll tell the market makers will say, I'm wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. We, we provide liquidity. We shrink spreads. And others will say, no, that if you did do that, you could actually find more liquidity in the middle of the spread. So it's an open debate still. I personally think there's a lot more that, you know, if payment for flow wasn't there, you could find better trades for you. So, you know, the, the limit orders would build and so on. Anyway. That's IEX. They're, they're still moving, but go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, well, real quick, um, uh, the regular, regulatory side, um, is there anything going on there that's going to give us hope that, uh, you know, they're going to clean things up even further with the HFTs or should we just uh, just get comfortable with the fact that, that these guys are so connected, they're just going to stay? Yeah. Well, here's a good example. A few years ago, the, uh, the SEC proposed something called the transaction fee pilot. Basically, what we're, the exchanges also have a system where it's payment for order flow. 
where they charge you if you take orders, if, you, if, you, if you're a maker on an exchange, they give you a rebate. So if I post liquidity, I get a rebate. If I take liquidity, I pay them. So it's called a maker take a model, right? The SEC a few years back said, eh, this is very distortive. We're not sure about this model. We don't really like it. Let's do a test. Let's do a pilot where we would flatten that out. And they had these different buckets where they said, okay, this is going to be a no rebate model. This will be a flat fee model. And we're going to test it. Just a pilot, right? Just a pilot. We're going to test the exchanges and their lobbyists and their, the powerful money behind them fought this thing tooth and nail, sued the SEC. They sued the regulator and quashed it. Basically got it gone. Never happened. We couldn't and, even- And, and, and they, were just, they, they were just quashing a test, right? They weren't quashing a, a binding decision, just, just a test. Just a test. Yeah. They weren't changing the rules. We were just testing it. But they knew, the exchanges knew that if this thing went through, it would probably prove the fact that rebates do distort volume, that rebates are costly, and they really shouldn't be there. IEX, by the way, is a flat fee. You pay the same rate if you make or take. That's what we believe is the best model. I'm happy to pay. I believe exchanges provide a service, and I'm happy to pay them a tenth of a penny, two tenths of a penny, whatever it would be, to make or take them. That's good. But they, they, they play the game with the rebates because the HFTs want the rebates because they know they can make money. For instance, an HFT can buy a stock for $10 and sell it for $10 and still make money. And you're like, wait a second, what are you talking about? You bought and sold it at the same price. Well, they collect a rebate on one side and they maybe get something flat on the other side and they make a half a penny. But you do that millions of times a day. Guess what? You made a ton of money. And that's what the whole model is built on. So just to prove the point that hard, the, the, the wheels of Wall Street regulatory chain, they go very slow. And anytime a, a, an invested party can throw some sand in that wheel, they will, and they will be down in D.C. telling everybody, guys like me don't know what we're talking about. You don't know what they don't know. This is what, this is good for investors, and it's very difficult to change. However, I'm very excited about Chairman Gensler. He knows what he's doing. He was a CFTC chair. He understands markets. He understands what the problems are. He, I hope you know the exchanges don't get in his ear too much, but they're supposedly uh, preparing a report about what went on in GameStop and AMC earlier in the year, and maybe something comes out of that. You know, we do think that there might be some proposals. Banning payment for order flow would be lovely, but I doubt it's going to happen. Maybe they will tweak it a little. Maybe we'll try the transaction fee pilot again. But, you know, they need to do some, there's certainly issues here that need to be addressed because problems do occur. And then people wonder, well, how did that happen? Well, you never addressed it. All right. Well, depressing to hear your lack of confidence that big changes are, are likely to happen. Optimistic to hear, though, that you um, are optimistic about uh, the new SEC chairman, Gary Gensler. Um, and then you said, you know, sometimes problems happen which get attention. Well, so we just had a problem with a flash crash in the precious metals. Um, and it's interesting you brought up Gensler in his time at the CFTC. This has long predated his time there, but the precious metals market has been certainly apparently uh, vulnerable to raids where the price does get kind of monkey hammered, sometimes with, with really, I think, surprising, maybe even sickening and irritating consistency. Um, <laughs> but this was a true sort of flash crash that happened uh, on Sunday evening as uh, $4 billion worth of, of contracts were sold within minutes uh, right at the Asian market open when you know markets are pretty thinly traded because America's asleep at that point in time. Um, it's, not, it's something that nobody would do who cared about getting a good price, right? So uh, can you explain what happened and then maybe also opine on how can we let that happen? I mean, it, it just, it, it doesn't seem like something that if, if, if you were running, you know, the system like, like Gensler is now responsible for, you wouldn't want somebody to be able to come and do that and basically weighing the price Mm -hmm. of a major world commodity around buy so much in such a small fraction of time. Yeah, that I mean, I, I'm just I don't trade futures myself, so I'm not involved in that market. But when I looked at that afterwards, it looked very similar to the 2010 equity flash crash that we had here. And not only were the charts almost identical on an intraday basis, but the story of the big fund coming through with that large amount of volume. That was the same story that apparently happened on the flash crash, which is still debatable, by the way, how that happened. But what I think happens is if a big if an imbalance comes through and going back to liquidity in a book, it is extremely fickle and is extremely automated now. It's not limit orders placed by investors like me and you, it's automated algorithms that tend to look at all different markets, that look for all signals. And when a signal comes through that they don't like, 
they get the hell out of the way. Or even worse, they exacerbate it and get on the other side and really push it down. So when you look at the 2010 flash crash, what I think happened there was orders came through. It set off all sorts of signals. Buyers who happened to be there walked away. And there was one HFT um, reportedly in the press. He said this. He goes, I went to my computer and I typed the ticker. I typed in HF stop, which means get me out. He wiped out his entire book, basically walked away. So that liquidity started to disappear. Others saw that leaning on it a little bit more. And here's the kicker, I think. What happens is once a lot of these stop losses start to move. So people will put a stop loss order in thinking that they're protecting themselves. But a lot of folks didn't realize that the stop loss converts to a market order. If you don't have it as a stop loss limit, you're going to get hurt. So if you put those in, make sure you put a stop loss limit on them. A stop loss market means as soon as my price activates because of a, it sees a price being on the, on the screen, go as a market order and go hit the bid. Well, guess what? If the guys all typed in HF stop, there's no bids to hit. And this is what happened in the flash crash. Stocks that were trading at $50 a share traded at one penny, 0 0.01. How can that be? Because there were no bids. The limit orders basically evaporated and it hunted looking for a bid and it found a bid down at a penny, which was called a stub quote. It basically, everything just, whoosh, it went down that quick. And then sure enough, just as fast as it went down, it started to tick back up. The SEC and the stock market has since then put in what they call limit up, limit down rules, which will try to prevent some of this stuff. They got rid of these so-called stub quotes and you have to have two-sided markets. We don't see it as often as we used to, but we still still see many flash crashes out there. So, you know, that's a problem. That's what that, that tells me that the limit order books that we keep talking about are not robust. They're not there. It's filled with algorithms. It's, it's filled with automated traders who are looking for signals. And all they're doing is pinging all day long. And it doesn't matter, 24-7. They're trading crypto during the weekend. They're trading futures in gold at night. They're trading currencies. They trade everything. And that's what they, HFTs don't trade one asset class. They trade them all. And when one asset class signals something, it might signal something to another asset class. And boom, off they go. It has nothing to do with fundamentals anymore. And then the suckers, or not suckers, the, 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 the people who get taken advantage of think something's going on, and really nothing was going on in gold at the time, and choo, off they went, and the next thing you know, they're going back up. Well, so I got I to gotta bring it back to, at the very beginning of this interview, we briefly touched on uh, prices of assets today probably being pretty fairly divorced from fundamentals. So we have liquidity being provided by the Fed and now by Congress. Uh, that's that's distorting prices upwards, right? So they're not based on fundamentals. We now have a trading system <laughs> that you said can get away from fundamentals as well. Are we setting ourselves up for just some colossal reckoning here, where uh, you know, untethered from fundamentals, heading upwards and and un, uh, you know, driving prices upwards, and untethered from fundamentals in terms of how the plumbing operates? Um, can there? Can, what's the potential for you know, some horrendous moment where the two of those just collide. It's there. I'm not going to say it's not. I mean, I, I do think those 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 circuit breakers that are in will stop to an extent. They're even they're market wide circuit breakers that will stop it. It's I think it's seven percent, fifteen percent, so on. But you know, the old saying that the market takes the steps up and the elevator down, right? Well, the elevator could snap and you could free fall. Yes, it could happen. It happens. It happens. Okay, and and it will correct itself, but. You know, I do think, like I said, I think they put some safeguards in place to prevent it from falling 10 floors, maybe. Maybe it'll only fall two floors now and then it'll stop. But yeah, there are a lot of fundamental distortions, right? There's a lot of stuff out there that I don't believe is, you know, I don't think are, but the price is the price. In the end, if why is somebody paying $20 million for a mansion when last year it went for $10 million? The price is the price. The market sets the price. Who am I to say that the markets are given the wrong price? I'm just a trader. I don't know what I'm doing. The market tells me what the price is. That's what I do. I believe in markets. But sometimes markets are influenced, right? And sometimes markets do get out of whack. And you're right. You, you can easily correct. And what's going to cause that correction? You know, all it's going to take probably is some Fed comment, right? And off she goes. And, you know, everyone will get nervous and panic. And maybe it'll be short term. Maybe it won't be. But it, it could easily happen again. But I don't think it's going to be as bad as the flash crash of the original one in 2010 because of those safeguards that they did put in. OK, good. And, and that was the question I was going to ask. Um, I, I do. I, I'll ask this follow up to it, which is generally what usually gets you is the stuff you don't know you don't know. Um, and so we have these new protections in place, which hopefully 
they will work when needed. Um, but that that expression about the market taking the stairs on the way up and the elevator on the way down, that's an old expression, right? That goes back to the days when trades were placed by real people in real time. Mm -hmm. Now we have the vast, vast, vast majority of trades being done algorithmically, which literally happens in microseconds, which is makes the time you and I blink our eyes in eon, right? Okay. So is, is there a danger here that the elevator can drop at a speed way faster than it used to in the old days? Uh, and that if we, we find out that all the protections that we, we put in place don't work in every scenario, that the advancement and sophistication of the technology could maybe even make this even worse? I mean, you, well, you it mentioned would be a fast, Yeah, it'll be a fast drop because it'll go so quick and then it'll, it'll immediately halt. The predictions will come in, the circuit breakers will kick, but maybe in the old days, it might've taken a few hours to make a move that might now may take a second or less, right? It will be extremely fast. When it does happen, you won't be able to react. It'll be too late, right? And then you'll be like, okay, we're in a halt mode. What do we do now? We've got 10 minutes, 15 minutes before the next release comes. Then it depends, right? And it's, it's scary. It's scary. When you looked over the cliff and you don't see anything, it's going to cause more people to maybe panic. And then we'll see. We'll see what we're built on them. We'll see what kind of fundamentals are out there. We'll see what you're really made of, right? But that, <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, well, we're not trying to freak people out. Again, just trying to help people understand kind of what the system is. Um, yeah. All right, Joe, I, I hate to ask you this question as we wrap up here, um, but it was one that was on my list that I'd love at least your one minute uh, answer to. and We can go in deeper next time you're on. Um, but I think you've got an opinion about whether a Bitcoin ETF will actually ever see the light of day or not. Do you have a prediction there? Uh, I have always been in the no side of that, and I'm still on the no side. I don't think it's going to happen yet. I do think eventually it will, but I think they got a lot of work to do to the main argument that the SEC, the SEC has denied numerous Bitcoin ETF applications. And the main reason is always we don't have any cross surveillance of these different exchanges. In other words, the, the exchanges are not regulated. The spot markets, at least our stock exchanges are regulated. And there's a lot to, a lot of people are watching. There are eyeballs in. The underlying stock, spot markets on the Bitcoin exchanges, which are not regulated. So here's what they're trying to do. The, the industry wants this ETF really bad. You know why? Because they get to the hell out of the damn thing. So everybody thinks right. it's a good thing. They're going to, it's going to help the pros, people. The reason why they want a Bitcoin ETF is not to help Mr. Retail, me and you. It's to help the pros arb out the futures against the cash. This is what they do all day. It's a constant arb. And they're going to make a ton of money off this thing. So what they're saying is, hey, guess what? We're going to create an ETF based on Bitcoin futures because the futures are regulated by the CFTC. That should solve your problem, right, Joe? No, because you know what the futures are based off of? the underlying spot market. And it's something called a Bitcoin reference rate, which they develop based on a number of different exchanges. So it's this circular logic. I don't think the SEC is going to buy it. I think they're going to continue to say no until they get a grip on what's going on. They need eyeballs on this underlying. Otherwise, there, there's a problem because the next thing you know, pension funds are going to be putting it in their portfolio. Uh, mutual funds are going to be putting it in and they're going to think it's regulated, but it's not. So I don't have a problem with crypto itself. I like crypto. I think it's, you know, I think it's a very fascinating area. I'm certainly not an expert, but I like to look at it. I think it's really interesting. I think it's great. But when you talk about an ETF, that's a that's a security. Okay. And when you're putting a wrapper, I call it a wrapper around a product like an ETF, well, you better make sure that it's that it's regulated properly. Otherwise, you really shouldn't be putting it out there. So my opinion is no, you're not going to see it certainly by the end of the year. I doubt you'll see it by the end of the next year. But I think the industry needs to do some more work to convince the SEC that, that this is something that they can at least self-regulate. All right. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. And it certainly builds on, you know, wh why do they want to make sure that it's regulated at least close to as much as stocks? Well, for all the reasons we've been talking about for the past hour. Uh, so that makes a ton of sense. Thanks for that. And just to, to help folks understand, when you're talking about the exchanges that the cryptos trade on, you're talking about like Coinbase and Binance and Kraken and, and, and those Correct. types of companies, right? Correct. Exactly. All right. And those are, the, those are the ones that feed that reference rate, by the way, a lot of them. Anyway, but yes, exactly. All right. Well, Joe, look, it has been another phenomenal time talking with you. Thanks for giving us so much of your time and so much incredibly useful information about how uh, the you know underpinnings of our, our entire financial markets work. Uh, super fascinating. And uh, you're just always such a, a joy to talk to you. You, you. you help regular people understand a very complicated topic. Well, thanks so much for coming on, awesome. Joe. I hope we can have you on again. Yep. Thank you for inviting me, Adam. You know, I love to share this. I love to I'll talk about market structure anytime.
Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll do it again soon. Thanks, Jeff. You got it. Take care. We hope you've enjoyed this excellent discussion with market trader Joe Saluzzi. You know, at this point, most of you are probably asking yourselves, how the heck am I supposed to navigate all these challenges? This is yet one more reason why we at Wealthion recommend working with a professional financial advisor who is keyed into the true way these markets operate. If you've already got a good one, great, stick with them. They're hard to find. But if you don't, or would like to hear the counsel of another experienced firm, consider scheduling a no commitment, no strings attached consultation with a financial advisor endorsed by Wealthion. These are the same experts who join me on this program every week. Just go fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. It only takes a couple of seconds and it could just change the trajectory of your financial future. But hey, before you go, please don't forget to hit the like button and then click the subscribe button below if you haven't already, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. It only takes a second and it really does help us out as the more subscribers this channel has, the more big name experts we can attract onto this program in the future. Okay, many thanks for subscribing folks and thanks for watching.